Good morning again. Good morning. We uh, finished up uh, week 17 of the pandemic. Uh, we've seen a, a few significant days of, uh, uh, or days with uh, significant reductions at least. We've been down below 60 now for three days and um, that's about half of what we were a, a week or so ago. So progress being made, we're really excited about that. Um, uh, the reentry task force met last uh, Monday night and I thought I, I uh, it might be helpful to give you a little update on uh, kind of what uh, what they talked about. Uh, uh, we just got a little report of how things were going to start with and so you might understand is that uh, in the total of the, for the four worship services each week in July they've been averaging about 230 people total. Um, that number in uh, 2018 and 19 was about 900 people for the same uh, same period. So around about 26% of what might, you might call normal. Uh, but the interesting thing is that there's 13 to 1400 that are uh, views on uh, YouTube watching the worship service. And uh, that compared to less than 150 last year. So clearly people have, uh, have changed um, and embraced the, uh, the uh, online version. Uh, now I know that YouTube views and all of that is uh, it, it's sort of it's difficult to really analyze but it's something to compare at least so we're still getting a lot of folks that are watching the service that's the point uh, there's uh, currently about 18 small groups that are meeting throughout the week um, that's a uh, that's a pretty good uh, indication that number is continuing to grow uh, there's four solid commitments right now from uh, Sunday school classes that plan to start back up uh, sort of when they uh, uh, get the green light and uh, of course as you know we have not really talked about our class uh, we've been sort of watching the numbers of new cases of uh, the coronavirus and uh, but those are coming down so we're hopeful that maybe we can start talking about that uh, in a not too uh, distant future um, and I wanted to just uh, just mention to you, talk to you real quickly, just about the worship services themselves. For those of you who have not attended one in person, um, let me uh, say first of all that uh, that I am not trying to talk anybody into coming that's not comfortable with it. If uh, you're not getting out of your house much and um, and you're not comfortable getting out, then my golly, just stay at home and continue to do what you're doing. But if you're going to the grocery store, if you're going to uh, Walmart, if you're going to the beauty shop, um, you know, if you're going out to all these places, uh, putting gas in your car or whatever, then I would, uh, would suggest that the uh, sanctuary building at Christ United Methodist Church is safer than any of those places. And, um, so I would, uh, would encourage you to maybe give it, give it a try. Uh, Linda and I have attended since they first started, and I know Bill and Jan have. And um, the, uh, you know, we found it to be uh, completely safe. The, there's some protocols that have been put in, into place. I've been, since I've been on the task force, I was sort of uh, involved in helping develop some of those protocols, so I'm very aware of what they do. Uh, just uh, as some examples, uh, attendees uh, who come to the worship service enter through certain doors and when they exit, they exit through different doors so that the people coming in and going out do not meet each other in the hallways. Um, the entire sanctuary building is sanitized between every service um, and uh, that, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, all of the touch points in the hallways, the restrooms are sanitized, and all the pews in the worship center are sanitized. They've got these little um, things they wear on their back. I think they go around and it's sort of like a mist that they just literally uh, treat every pew in the church in about 10 or 15 minutes. It's, it's pretty amazing uh, to watch that being done. And, uh, <clears throat> and it uh, completely sanitizes the whole place. So, um, and I can tell you with 50 to 75 people in the worship center, there is no problem with uh, social distancing. So you can uh, sit as far away from folks as you want to and, 
And, um, you know, it's been nice. We've struck the sing again a little bit with masks on. Now you'll see uh, uh, nearly everybody that comes in has a mask on. And most of them, in the 8 o'clock service anyway, kept their mask on throughout the uh, service. So it's, it's just, um, you know, I would encourage you to try it. And if you do try it and you're not comfortable, um, I'd be interested in just knowing what you were uncomfortable with so we could maybe address that. But uh, anyway, that's just a plug for, uh, for giving, a, giving the worship service a, a shot in person. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, really beginning to go on here at church again. Uh, if you're not aware of it, uh, the youth are having 50 to 70 youth throughout the week of 10 different uh, programs they have. Uh, UM Army is going to be um, up and running next week uh, and they're going to do some local projects. And they have what they call Axe Camp for the 1st through the 7th graders. Uh, it's going to be held at the end of July, that's the current plan. And they're still planning uh, to start up uh, children's and, uh, and uh, youth Sunday school programs uh, probably early in, uh, in August before school starts. So, uh, so there's things going that we're beginning, we're continuing to move forward. Um, we feel good about the protocols that we have. And so uh, that's sort of where we are uh, as far as uh, moving forward on uh, things going on here at the church. Um, I now have a confession. I have been derelict in my duties. Um, we have failed to recognize birthdays for the last four months. And I don't know how in the world I could let something like that go, but we want to, uh, to uh, recognize all of those of you who had birthdays in uh, uh, April, May, June, and July. And uh, we've got a little uh, deal. We do not have cookies we can share uh, online, but uh, I'm not going to go through and read all these names. Uh, there are, uh, uh, I will put those in my newsletter when I send that out. But... Uh, I will say that this list includes uh, three people who are not actually in our class, but they have uh, been very regularly uh, watching our Sunday school class on Sunday morning. So uh, we've included uh, Connie Kahn and Larry Lightfoot and uh, Stephen uh, Elsesser, and they have been uh, regular attendees, if you will, at our class. So uh, happy birthday, y'all. I'm not going to sing to you today. I know you'll all be glad to hear that. But um, we'll try to, uh, to do better in recognizing the birthdays each month from now on. So happy birthday to all of you for making another year. Uh, Wilma uh, is still uh, reminding us to, uh, to uh, let uh, Jan know uh, if you uh, attend Sunday school this Sunday. And uh, the... Uh, so that'll move us on into prayer requests. Uh, we uh, continue to have some significant requests and needs in our class. Um, I want to ask you, of course, to continue to pray for, for our country. Uh, we'll always do that and, uh, and to pray for God to, uh, to reunify us. Uh, we want to pray for our church and for the staff, you know, as we do begin to, to continue to reopen things here at the church. Uh, the staff is sort of doing double duty, you know, they're, uh, they're doing all of the in-person stuff and then the online stuff as well. So um, we want to continue to pray for them, uh, continue to pray that God will take the COVID-19 away. Uh, we're kind of tired of this now. And uh, so uh, we pray that, uh, continue to pray that, uh, that our, our land, that our city will be, uh, be relieved of that. Um, I heard from uh, uh, Kathy, uh, uh, once again, I may have shared this uh, last week, that Alicia and Toby and Caden are now on a uh, schedule for a flight on August the 1st to fly back to the United States. And uh, so uh, we're praying that that will happen. If not sooner, they continue to look for an earlier flight. But uh, I know they're getting uh, excited about that. And then of course, uh, as I shared uh, uh, earlier this week about Polly uh, and her, her brother Skeet, I uh, continue to worry about their dad that can't see him and uh, he's very, very ill in the hospital. And uh, so I do uh, thank all of you for, uh, 
that we're able to pause uh, Tuesday night and to pray for them. Uh, it meant a lot to Polly. And uh, so uh, just continue to lift them up and pray for them because this is a really tough time for them. Uh, on the, uh, the praises side, I uh, uh, contacted Ward Turner last night and their daughter Martha. He says she uh, continues to do better. She's doing much better, in fact. Still has restrictions on her activities, but um, she's gradually beginning to get back to normal. So we're, we're thankful for that and um, thank, thankful for God's uh, answered prayer. So with that in mind, I will pray and uh, Bill will teach us. Father in heaven, as we uh, come together today, I do just thank you for this class and for, uh, for being a, a truly caring group of people that care about each other. Uh, I just lift up Polly and, uh, and Skeet in their time of need. Lord, this is a, a time they feel very helpless and uh, just really need your comfort to be on them and we just pray for that and continue to pray for Alicia and Toby and Caden as they uh, anxiously await their flight to come back to the U.S. and just pray that that'll happen. Um, that your hand will be on them, that you'll continue to protect them. Um, and Lord, we do just ask that you would continue to protect us all from the coronavirus and, and just pray that this will uh, become a thing of the past. Uh, in the meanwhile, we pray that somehow you can use this to reach people in, in the name of Jesus and that, that people will begin to, to really realize their need for you. We just ask now that you uh, continue to be with Bill as he, um, uh, as he leads us in our study. And we just ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, friends with Christ class. Uh, I didn't realize how long we've been doing that until I saw all the birthdays on the screen. A lot of y'all have gotten a year older since we've last met, and I want to wish you all a happy birthday. Fortunately, I didn't get older. I had my birthday back in March, so I'm still perennially young. And I hope you believe that. Okay, today we are going to continue with the Olivet Discourse of Jesus that he began in Matthew chapter 24. We're going into Matthew chapter 25 today, which is the conclusion of that Olivet Discourse. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples here and his followers on the Mount of Olives and telling them what is going to happen in the end times. Now, this is centered around a question that they have. Uh, and it's the same question you and I would likely have as well. Jesus is talking about the second coming when he is going to return again. And what do the disciples want to know? Exactly what you and I want to know. When is that going to happen? And Jesus doesn't answer that question. He, in essence, what he tells them in his answer is, uh, it's, it's not for you to know. It's, if I may paraphrase, it's none of your business. Because that's not what Jesus wanted them to concern themselves with. To know that the coming of Christ is going to happen, and there are signs that are going to point to that throughout history, but the question they needed to be asking is, what do we do in the meantime? Not satisfy our curiosity and tell us when you're going to come, but tell us what our marching orders are. What are our instructions while we're still here on earth after you've ascended to be with God the Father and before you return? So Jesus is answering this question in the Olivet Discourse, and in chapter 25, he does so by sharing three parables here. Three parables centered around the second coming. Now you'll notice something in these parables. There's an element of uh, God's judgment in this, but there's also the component of God's rewarding people who are found faithful. So let's take a look real quickly at these, um, these three parables in, in Matthew chapter 25. Parable one is the uh, parable of the 10 virgins or the 10 bridesmaids. Remember these titles of the parables weren't given by Jesus. They were made by interpreters that added that to it. And the simple message is, the short and sweet of it is, be ready. Jesus says, I'm coming again. You need to be ready. Parable number two is the parable of the loan money or the parable of the talents may be more familiar to some of you. And Jesus is telling us there, Use what God has entrusted to you 
before I return. And then the third parable is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And the third thing Jesus tells us to do is to serve others in need while we're waiting on him to return. So let's take a look at this first parable, if we will. Uh, parable number one, the parable of the ten virgins or the parable of the bridesmaids. He's saying you need to have eternal vigilance. You need to be vigilant all the time before I return. And again, the tagline is be ready, be ready. We saw that throughout Matthew chapter 24 and um, that's what this parable is about. Now let's take a look at verse one. It begins at that time. At that time refers to the time when Jesus does actually return. And at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lampstands or their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. And then verse five says, the bridegroom who is Christ in the parable was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now at midnight, it's dark now, need those lamps. At midnight, the cry rang out. Now let me pause here and say that many scholars believe that this reference to the cry rang out is a reference to the trumpet of Christ, the trumpet of God that is blown before or when Jesus returns, kind of the same thing. So at midnight, the cry rang out, the trumpet was sounding, here is the bridegroom, come out to see him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. Well, no, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived and the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. Now catch this, and the door was shut. That is significant. Later, the others came uh, also and said, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. You hear him banging on the door there. And he said, truly I tell you, I don't know you. I don't know you. What sad words. Therefore, Jesus says, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Now, these foolish bridesmaids represent those who were, uh, failed to persevere by waiting for Jesus to come. You know, they got busy doing their own thing and nothing mattered. And so, man, he's not coming tonight or he's not coming tomorrow, so I don't need to get any oil. Well, surprise, surprise. There's a point that needs to be made and it comes from the Holman Bible commentary. I thought I'd stick it in here. This parable does not describe a true disciple who loses his salvation, okay? But it's a false one whose commitment to Jesus was deficient from the start. So this isn't a matter of losing salvation as some say you can. That's not the point of this parable. These foolish bridesmaids never were believers in the first place. So that's the warning, be ready. Now let's take a look at a summary. I've given a summary of each of these parables. They're very simple, self-explanatory somewhat. In this parable, Jesus is warning us to always be ready with oil in our lamps. The bridegroom, who is Christ, will come when he is least expected, even though he has tarried long. It's been now almost 2,000 years, hasn't it? And the groom's delay in coming caused some to be unready. Here's the point, verse five. As believers, we must always be ready for the return of Christ. As believers, we must always be ready for the return of Christ. And you can take this, parallel, this parable and understand it what good is a lamp without oil? It's useless. Without the oil, it cannot give out light. And without the oil of Christ in our lives, we're like that lamp. We're there, but we don't fulfill the purpose for which we were created. And some scholars tell us, and I like this, that uh, 
The oil in the lamp is representative of the Holy Spirit. And for us to be ready for Christ, we need to be like that lamp. We need to be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit in order to uh, sustain us, in order to be ready for the second coming of Christ. So that's the first parable, the parable of the bridesmaid. Jesus says, be ready. The second parable continues with that thought. It's the parable of the loan money or the parable of the talents. And Jesus' message here is quite simply, be responsible. Be ready and now be responsible. And the tagline with that is, use what God has entrusted to you. Now let me make a comment here as we move on. A talent in this parable is not a talent like you and I would think of a talent of someone who could sing or play the piano or do something really spectacular that few others can do. A talent was simply a weight or a measure. And uh, it would be like saying a weight of gold is more valuable than a weight of, or a talent of gold is uh, more valuable than a talent of silver or a talent of silver is worth more than a talent of rocks. So it's, it's a measure and it measures financial things as well. Now in this parable, the concept of rewards is central here. Uh, it speaks of the rewards of people who come into the, uh, the kingdom future of God, uh, they're going to be rewarded because of their faithfulness to God, not because of their salvation, but because of from their salvation, they were faithful to the opportunities of serving other people. And there's a contrast in this parable as well to those people who don't use their gifts, they don't use their opportunities for service, and those people are not going to be rewarded, rather they are going to incur the judgment of God. Now this is not, again, something we do for our salvation, it's something we do because we are already saved. In verse 14, again it will be like a man going on a long journey. The man in this parable is Jesus, the journey is the time between the ascension and the second coming. And this man calls his servants and uh, entrusted his wealth to them. And to one he gave five bags of gold, five talents of gold, if you will, to another two, and to another one bag, each one according to his ability, and then he went on a journey. Well, the man who had received the, the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. Good investor. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more, another good investor. But, verse 18, the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Verse 20, the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. And his master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Well, the story repeats itself in verse 22. The second man who uh, had two bags of gold to him, had two bags of gold given to him, and uh, he comes back to Jesus, to the master, and he says, you've entrusted me with two bags of gold. Look, I had two more. The master says the same thing to him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. So come and share your master's happiness. Okay, first two guys are doing it right. They got it, they got it down, okay? But verse 24, the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know you're a hard man. Harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid the gold in the ground. So here's what belongs to you. Now this hard man term here in verse 24 is a man that is cruel, is uh, ruthless, and probably an opportunist. He didn't plant, he didn't, uh, uh, he didn't harvest what he had sown, he didn't gather what he uh, not scattered it says. In other words, he had no right to claim what he had harvested. And he implied that he had no true knowledge of the master. And that's the critical part of this thing. This third man really did not know and he did not trust and he did not believe in the master. So what did he do? He did his own thing. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Now, look at the reply of the master in verse 26. He says, you wicked, lazy servant. I don't want to be called that by Jesus, I assure you. So you knew that I harvest where I haven't sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well then, he says, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest at least. So take the bag of, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has been given more, they will have in abundance. And whoever does not have, whatever they have will be taken from them. So throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Pretty harsh judgment there, I would say. Now let's look at verse 29 just a little more carefully. The first part of the verse says, Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. When you and I have received the grace of God, and we serve God with what He has given us to do, we can expect blessings, even more blessings from God. But the second part of verse 29 says, but whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Yeah, there are people in this world, and you know them, they've always been with us, who despise the blessings of God. They despise His presence in their lives. They despise the leadership that He tries, tries to give them, the direction, the sense of purpose. But essentially, this is the person who says, I don't need God. I'm my own God. I'm my own master. I will call the shots in my own life. And that's the kind of thing we have here. Isn't it sad in contrast that they would give up all the blessings of God all the while they're hanging on to the, the transient, temporary, minor things of importance in this world? What good would it do a person you know, to gain the whole world? and lose their soul. So that's the contrast of this parable. Let's do the summary. In this parable, Jesus is teaching us the responsibility that every servant has to be a good steward for what he's been given, whether it be great, whether it be small. The time of reckoning is coming when the king will require all of us to give an account of our stewardship. And that stewardship is not just financial stewardship. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with the talents that God has given you? Do you recognize your talents? Are the blessings of God more important than what you can gain in this world? That's the question. So Jesus says, first, be ready. Secondly, he says, be responsible. And thirdly, in this last parable, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, and Jesus is telling us in this parable, the quick tagline is, serve others in need. We will be judged by Jesus by the way we have treated other believers and other non-believers, I might add to that as well. So Jesus continues in verse 31 in this third parable. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, some scholars believe, and I think there's a lot of value in this, that this is going to happen during the millennial reign of Christ when he's on this earth ruling for a thousand years as recorded in Revelation chapter 20. So in this parable, the sheep are believers, the goats are non-believers. And by the way, if you're interested in an Old Testament uh, prophecy of this, look in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37 and verses 17 through 19 are an interesting read. Ezekiel 37, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 34, 17 through 19. Now let's look at verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you uh, are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance and the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. He's talking to the sheep here, of course. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to me. 
This may be a familiar passage to many of you. Well, what does the right man, righteous man say to him in response? Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we feed? Uh, when did we see you hungry? And when did we feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? Uh, when did we see you sick or in prison and go by? So in verse 40, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And that's his response to the, the sheep. But verse 41, he, then he will say to those on his left, these are the goats. He's going to tell the goats on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Just the opposite with the goats, isn't it? And they give a very similar but opposite answer in verse 44. They answer, they'll also answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger needing clothes or sick in prison and didn't help you? When did that happen? We totally missed it, they're saying. They weren't watching, were they? And the master will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did, did not do for one of the least of these you didn't do it for me either. And then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's the contrast. That's the choice we make and the results of that choice. Are we going to go to eternal judgment or are we going to have eternal life? I had to see, sneak a little quote from A.W. Tozer in right here, and I just think it's great, and I think we ought to take it with us and marinate on this little thought. Tozer said, eternal life is not a gift from God. It is the gift of God. Isn't that great? Eternal life is not a gift from God. It is the gift of God, the gift of God Himself. Let's take a look at the summary. This parable has been described as uh, a much loved and mu much misunderstood parable. It's about the last judgment it's about the sheep and the goats when they're divided by Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, when He's on His throne. And the basis of the judgment is the way that they have treated the Son of Man by the way that they have treated other believers. What a great, great statement. Jesus is teaching us that uh, if men ignore or reject his followers and reject the message of his church they're essentially rejecting him and they will suffer eternal judgment let's look at this last cell here as we grow in our discipleship we minister to others and ministry being defined as meeting the needs of people in the name of Jesus but first and foremost, the greatest need that people have is salvation in Jesus Christ. So the takeaway from these three parables today is be ready, be responsible, and serve others. Now that concludes Matthew chapter 25, and I do want to make a note right here for several of the real smart alecky people in our class. I covered a whole chapter in one session. So mark this day in history. We'll put up a historical marker right here. It's a miracle. And Tom <laughs> says it's a miracle. Well, it is, and I'm still shocked too. Um, next week, we're going to be in chapter 26. Ma Matthew chapter 26 is a long, detailed, and very, very rich chapter. And I would encourage you at least to start reading the first couple of sections of Matthew chapter 26. I'm not going to promise you next week we're going to cover all of it. I can promise you we will not. But uh, it is a great chapter. We're getting very, very close to Jesus going to the cross. And many of the stories and the details of this chapter will be familiar to you. But we're going to break it down and see what else we can learn from it. Let's pray together. Father, we can really get excited and may we never take for granted that uh, Jesus is going to come again. There's, that's a reality. Your word promises. Your son has said it. And you guarantee it. 
So Lord, I pray that we will indeed do what we have learned from these parables today, that we would be ready, we would be responsible, we would serve others in the meanwhile we're waiting for that event to happen. So Father, I pray that we will um, all understand that we don't do this for our salvation, we do it from our salvation because we are saved by the grace of God that we want to do these things to bring glory to Jesus. So help us with this takeaway and um, bless us until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.